All right. Um, I'm Kim Bailey, and as Mary said, I'm with Alzheimer's Orange County. Uh, I am a master's trained gerontologist working in the field of seniors uh, for about 27 years. So everything we talk about today, and it's going to be kind of fast and furious, uh, is really designed to give you tools, simple tools, to work with. And for many of you that, you know, have already been through some of this training, you may be using these tools already, and this maybe is just a refresher course. But, you know, I think it's good for all of us, even if we're very experienced, to have this type of training and reinforce our skills. How many of you are new with seniors helping seniors? Okay, just a few. But you see how long everybody stays? Isn't that a good yeah. sign? <laughs> That's a good sign. There's not a high level of turnover in this company because they know what they're doing. And I love the whole concept of having people of a certain age uh, working with older adults because you know what? They can't relate to people that are 20 years old. And they don't really, they can't fully understand their generational issues and they can't really relate to them culturally sometimes. And so, you know, this is a great concept and it's been working so well uh, over the past years here in South County. So congratulations to all of you for the fine work that you do. And so I've really got, this is like a three in one training. I've got three courses for you. The first one's about communication. The second one is about managing challenging behaviors. And the third one is about activities that you can do with your clients. And so uh, before we get in deep with the, that uh, content, we're going to do an overview of dementia. So, you know, what is dementia? You know, to this day out in the community, people are so confused. In fact, they tell me, oh, I'm so relieved my mother doesn't have Alzheimer's. She has dementia thinking that, you know, somehow that's better. And so I have to explain to people that um, dementia is like a general term. It's a broad term that really describes like a whole bunch of different types of brain impairments. Uh, they all affect memory and thinking and judgment and really the ability to have a person care for themselves. They all progress slowly and gradually, for the most part, over a long period of time. They're all irreversible, and they're, so they're all terminal. But apart from that, um, even though we've got like 70 different types, and a lot of people, by the way, have a mixed dementia, you know, really the common dementia is Alzheimer's. So sometimes I tell people, you know, that don't get it, I'll say, you know, Alzheimer's is apple and dementia is fruit. <laughs> you know, I try to come up with like little catchy things, you know, <laughs> you know, <because laughs> to sort of describe that. And so, uh, and we know that dementia is not a normal part of the aging process. What is it? It's a disease that gets in the way of successful aging. It's a disease process. So basically, it's a disease of the brain, and it starts in the area of the brain where memories are first formed, and it's called the hippocampus. And so uh, this is the area of the brain that takes in new memories and stores them so that the person can retrieve that information later. But then it's not just about the memory, it starts to spread through the brain and what we're looking at here are actual structures called plaques and tangles. And those are the biological features of Alzheimer's. And so they begin to form in each section of the brain in this kind of gradual, relentless march through the brain, impacting the area's uh, ability to perform its normal functions and eventually killing the brain cells. And so here they're talking about the area that controls emotions. And so you see people start to have personality changes and they're really quite different in mood and behavior than they were before Alzheimer's. 
Um, eventually, it destroys even the long-term memories um, that were, you know, the earliest precious memories. They'll hang on to those for a long time, but then eventually they lose that. And then ultimately, it goes into the area of the brain that controls the most primitive functions, uh, the most basic of functions like breathing and swallowing, etc. And so, you know, from start to finish, it's just this long progressive battle against the brain. And, you know, once patients succumb, um, you know, many times it leaves the families completely in shambles, right? They've been involved in caregiving maybe for a period of 10 to 15 years, um, sometimes less, but it has an impact on them, and that's why we are here to take away some of that burden and also, I think, to educate families a little bit about what's happening because they really don't understand it, do they? They think the person may be doing things on purpose, they think maybe they're manipulating. Uh, and so we're in sort of a constant tug of war with them trying to explain that when you have this level of brain damage, behavior is no longer a choice. And that we have to, there are things that we can do to make that person more comfortable, uh, you know, but it often feels like the families are sort of the last to know that, doesn't it? Yeah, so we have to be informed and we have to not only uh, be able to understand the disease it's ourselves, but we're sort of educators, you know, for the families. And we need them to know that it's not just about memory, but, you know, at a certain point it becomes about their language skills and their ability to understand and, and, and speak uh, in conversations. It's about their ability just to do simple tasks, things that, that they've done every day of their lives for, you know, years and years and years suddenly become complex or even dangerous for them to do. So, you know, I have this job at Alzheimer's Orange County that I absolutely love, but I have another separate job, and I've had it for six years, and I'm a caregiver for a 95-year-old with dementia. So I'll use some of, you know, what I see there as well as, you know, what I've seen working with my clients over all these years to illustrate some points. So I, when I talk about, like, tasks that become difficult for them to perform and then ultimately may become dangerous, I'm thinking about my client and tooth brushing, teeth brushing. You know, because she's a fanatic about her teeth, and she should be, because she's 95 and she still has them. <laughs> she's very proud of that. And so teeth brushing is sort of a ritual for her. And of course, now that she has dementia, she forgets that she brushed her teeth, and she wants to keep brushing them, right? Which is fine. That's okay, right? Rather than correct her and say, you just brush your teeth. It works out better for me to say, okay, let's brush our teeth, because you can't brush them too much, right? Can you? <laughs> However, what she used to do independently, you know, she now is doing with a, much more assistance from me because she tries to put the hand soap on the toothbrush. You know, the hand soap's here and the toothpaste is there, and, you know, for 94 years she's picked up the right stuff but now she's 95 with dementia, and so the first time I watched her trying to put hand soap on the toothbrush, I knew that's when I had to offer even more than a standing assist with this task. And so, and so it goes. Almost all the tasks that they did on their own before, you know, are now complicated and leave them open to risk. And so as they progress, we offer more and more assistance, but we do it in a dignified way, right? Because what happens when somebody has to do everything for you? It's so embarrassing. You know, it really is, we're, and we're all touchy about it, aren't we? I offered to help a friend of mine the other night, and she said, stop treating me like one of your clients. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I went, I was just trying to be kind, and she's ultra-sensitive. She goes, at my age, when someone offers to help me, 
I take it personally, like they think I can't do it myself anymore, and I'm like, oh, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, what? Well, I know, but it just goes to show you what a sensitive topic it is with people. You know, and we're what, you know, we're Americans, right? And it's our norm to be independent and take care of ourselves. And so when we start, like, quote, unquote, taking things away from people, it's a very sensitive area. And so I'm going to be giving you some tips um, on how we can do that. But, yeah, their ability to perform tasks is affected um, their visual spatial perception is different, isn't it, when they have dementia? Do you know um, the thing about the vision? I think I made everybody do this last time. But let's do it again, just because it's so, it makes us understand what it's like to live in their world. Their vision, it starts to slant downward, and they begin to lose their peripheral vision. And so they sort of go into a type of tunnel vision. And so I think we need to try that. But please be careful because I didn't make you say, sign waivers. And I don't want anybody suing me. But if you're comfortable, you don't have to do it. But just stand up and put your binoculars on. And just kind of move around a little bit real carefully. And I'm going to look. At, I'm going to cheat so I can see that you're, if you're doing it. <laughs> so you're looking down. And you're, you've got your binoculars over your eyes real tightly, right? And so what does that feel like? Man, that's not good, is it? All right, let's sit down before we fall down. <laughs> so how did that feel? Wow. I know, physically it's uncomfortable, but it's also kind of scary, isn't it? So, you know what, just remember from this day forward, they perceive the world in a different way than we do. They don't see what we see, they don't hear what we hear, all of their senses are affected. And so, you know, that little knowledge there can really inform us of something very important, and that's how to approach a person. So if you know this is how they see the world, then you are not going to do this. Hey, Charlotte, how are you? I'm here to take care of you. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? <laughs> no, no, I like you. I like you. <laughs> so first of all, I approached her from the behind, and I probably scared her, right? Oh, yes. So what could she have done? Yeah. Boom. <laughs> she could have smacked me. I wouldn't have blamed her. And I'm doing everything else wrong, too. I'm, like, hovering over her. If her vision slants downward now, then I probably look like a giant. And I'm in her space, and I'm touching her inappropriately. Right? Sorry. <laughs> and I didn't ask her if she wanted to be my volunteer. That was really rude. So we should give you a hand. <laughs> <laughs> so now, you know, I know that I'm going to approach her from the front, and it's all about my body language, my tone of voice, my smile, and I'm not going to get in her space, but I am going to go down to her eye level, and I might just yeah, say, hi, Charlotte, how are you today? <laughs> you doing okay? Have to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you sure have a pretty red blouse on. You look just beautiful today. Would you like to have lunch with me? No. Ah! <laughs> All right. So let's give a hand to Charlotte. <laughs> So it turns out that Charlotte rebuffed me, but generally speaking, they don't usually. Most people, when I use that approach, will pretty much follow me anywhere. But I mean, you know, the goal is just to not upset people. Our goal is to make people feel calm and needed and, you know, safe and all of those things. So even though she said no to me, well. I mean, my chances of her saying yes are going to be much higher using that approach than if I, you know, kind of came up from behind like that. 
right? So, yeah, so Alzheimer's and dementia doesn't just change a memory, but it, uh, it changes people's language and communication, their ability to do tasks, their visual, spatial, the way they actually perceive the world. And of course, if you had all that going on, you couldn't help but have a different behavior, right? And Diane here just asked a really important question. She said, does it always progress the same way? You know, because even though we couldn't really watch the film, you could kind of see how it was moving through certain areas. No, it's different for everybody. Everybody's different. Um, for some people, you know, they may have big deficits in the speech and behavior arena, or maybe that's just their memory. Um, you know, every person's unique. They go through their illness in their own way and in their own time. But I will tell you that a lot of the classic behaviors they see are not their fault. Guess whose fault they are? They're ours. Because really, everyone needs to learn how to manage uh, and treat people with dementia. And it's sort of counterintuitive to the way that we treat others. And so it's a skill that needs to be learned. And oh my gosh, we try so hard with the families, but there's so many that we don't reach. And so they are sort of unwittingly doing everything wrong, just like the approach thing and, and more, that you know kind of end up resulting in a behavior that wouldn't have happened had they been you know, had some training. So, um, because, you know, Alzheimer's is a disease of emotions. It really is. You know, and we start over here. This is like a simple continuum, isn't it? And we start over to the left because basically that's where they live. They live in a state of confusion. Um, you know, obviously they, there are good days and bad days. But there's always some level of confusion present. And if you lived in a constant state of confusion, I guarantee you that you would feel uncomfortable. And when we as humans feel uncomfortable, what do we do? We act out. So for us, we'd probably just call it like, what, a meltdown? <laughs> Has anybody ever not had a meltdown? I want to know your secret. <laughs> because it's the human condition. So, you know, what we tell families, and I'll tell you the same, is that this cycle can play itself out day after day, all day long with dementia. But the tools we're going to learn will help to sort of break that cycle a little. We can't stop it all the time. But, you know, we might be able to mitigate it a little bit. So that's the good news. So, and the promise is, is that if you adopt the skills that I'm going to talk about, you will, in fact, see less symptoms and fewer behaviors. So it's like, that's like gold, isn't it? Seriously, like if you're working with a client who has a lot of behaviors, it's like the thought of just being able to minimize that is so wonderful because then they're having a better quality of life and so are you. And so that's sort of the promise that we make. But we have to understand a few basic things. One is that, you know, we can't change the disease. We can't stop it. We can't turn it around. And so basically, where families sort of go wrong and get hurt is that they keep expecting that person to be able to do all the things that they did before because, hey, they look normal, right? Um, but so we, taught, we teach them you know, to lower their expectations because that will actually lower your frustrations. So, and I'll give you an example of that. Like sometimes we think, oh, well, you know what? She has early dementia, so I'm going to help her by quizzing her every day. You know, actually, I had a man call me and tell me that. You know, he called our helpline and he said, every, my, my wife was just diagnosed, so every morning we get up and I ask her like 50 questions because I want to keep her brain sharp. And I'm like, oh my God, does she even, do you give her coffee first? You know, it's like nobody wants to be interrogated first thing in the morning, right? 
But out of love, this was what he felt would be helpful for her. And so we really try to teach people to sort of keep their expectations in line with what's going on here. And then we also want you to know that, you know, your presentation, you know, your affect, um, your beliefs, your values, your personality, you know, you bring all that with you to work with your client. And the clients are very sensitive to that, you know, and so, and your own emotions. So, you know, like if we're having a bad day, they can sort of read that and then guess what? They're having a bad day. You know, so there's like this domino effect. So we really do, it's hard, but we've got to sort of check our own problems at the door, right? Because once we're there, it's all about them. And we don't want to convey, you know, any kind of sadness or unhappiness. So, and then when you do see behaviors, just remember, and I'll talk more about this in just a little bit, there's a reason for them. They don't usually happen randomly. There's reasons why they, these behaviors get triggered, and it's all around some kind of unmet need, okay? So the, the person, you know, something's wrong and they can't communicate it to you, and so they act out. Um, and, you know, the number one thing that you see too, just like I do, is UTI. You know, they get an infection and you don't know it, but you're seeing a sudden change in behavior, and so you need to think medical, right? You see, you know, agitation or even aggression that wasn't there before. They could be sick, and they just don't know how to tell you. So behavior is always about some kind of unmet need, so we sort of have to turn into private detectives and sort of learn to, you know, investigate. You know, what's going on with this behavior, and why is it happening? And what can I do to intervene appropriately? And then this last one, connecting, is more important than the task. This is like a big deal for me because I think as professional caregivers, everybody's got an agenda, right? I mean, you have your task that you're supposed to do. And so maybe your agenda is, okay, she's got a doctor appointment at 1, so we're going to take a shower at 11, lunch, you know, you've got this agenda. Well, your agenda is not their agenda. And sometimes, particularly if you're rushing them, I mean, they're going to come to a hard stop, right? I mean, I pretend like I'm not rushing. It's so funny. I just move around, you know, very casual. <laughs> but my mind is like going a million miles an hour. And what's so funny is my client sits in this um, like recliner chair and so she can't see me sometimes <laughs> so I'll be walking like this around her but then when I'm in the back of her I'm running around you know doing the dishes and trying to clean and trying to do all the things I'm supposed to do but I don't want her, her to see me amped up like that I've got to be calm cool and collected with her and if I push her to do a task she will say no and if you keep insisting, they will keep resisting. And then next thing you know, you've got a behavior. And so maybe I want her to take a shower, but maybe she's just not in the mood today. And so we might end up, you know, like sitting on the couch holding hands and looking at photos of her wedding because that's a favorite activity. And you know what? When we do that, we're making a powerful connection. It's powerful. She's happy. I'm happy. And, you know, so, yeah, we didn't get to the shower today. But you know what? That's okay. No one ever died from not having a shower, you know. I think we get a little intense, you know, about the things that we want to accomplish. So the connection is what we're looking for because words are going to fade away. Words will be fading away slowly over time. And so we're going to connect in nonverbal ways, and that might be, hugs, it might be, and, and that has to be appropriate, of course, um, and you know what I mean. And it might be with gestures, it might be through art, it might be through music. We'll find ways to connect with them all the way through the end of the disease, and it can be done, and we will be able to do it. So 
One of the things we know about people with dementia is they lie. <laughs> right? Don't they? I mean, they do. They say things that aren't true. So we have a fancy word for that, confabulation. <laughs> They're con the client is confabulating today, right? But guess what? <laughs> we lie too. But we have another fancy word for that, and that's therapeutic fibbing. <laughs> the point is that they say things that aren't true, but that's their truth. And so instead of correcting them or prompting them, we're going to let them have that reality. And when we do that, things are going to go much better. And so when we do some of the things I'm going to talk about, this is the end result. Your client has a higher self-esteem, is feeling less frustrated, feeling good about themselves, all positive outcomes. And I'll give you an example. So I was working with this man at Alzheimer's Orange County, and um, we were doing a program, but he, he walked up to me. Some of you have heard this story, I think. But he walked up to me and he said, so where did you go to school? And I said, Cal State Fullerton. And he went, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, where did you go to school? And he said, Harvard. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, Harvard, okay. Tell me about Harvard. And for the next 10 minutes, oh my God, it, I swear he got taller. He was getting so puffed up and full of himself and big man on campus, relating all these wonderful stories. We had this fabulous connection going. Right toward the end, his wife walked up to me and said, he never went to college. <laughs> he never went to college. But see, she knew that, she just said that to me privately, right? Because she was a compassionate communicator. She could have walked in and said, what the hell are you talking about? You never went to school. And then how would he have felt? Stupid. He would have felt undignified. But look, when you play a lot, when you roll with the punches and you go with the flow and you step into their world instead of trying to reel them back in, you're going to see these benefits. And it's a beautiful thing to see. It really is. And there's nothing wrong with going to Cal State Fullerton. <laughs> right? I was lucky. Listen, I was lucky to go to college at all. And I didn't go till I was like in my 40s. So, you know. But Harvard, a little out of reach. All right. So the things we need to do to be a compassionate communicator besides the therapeutic fibbing is to be a good listener. This is not always easy because they repeat things over and over again, right? Are they doing that on purpose? No, why are they repeating? Because they have brain damage that pre in the area of the brain that saves new memories and new information. So you could tell them something 85 times, it won't matter because they have this area of damage. It's like a little computer with no save button. So it's pointless to say to them, you just ask me that, or I'm only gonna tell you this one more time. And it is crazy making, but we have to listen like we've never heard it before, and we can't interrupt, because what happens when we interrupt someone with dementia? Poof. They just, well, they just lose their train of thought. I mean, when we do it, it's pretty frustrating, right? Yeah. But when they do it, it's like, it's so easy to get them off the, the trail, you know, off the track. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Is there any way that they can tell that they have this by a blood test or anything? So it's just all... The question is, can uh, Alzheimer's or another dementia be diagnosed through a simple blood test. Oh, sorry, but no, it cannot. Um, it needs to be a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that they need to be tested from head to toe and all these other possible causes be ruled out. So people are over-medicated, looks like dementia. People with untreated and unchecked 
Depression looks like dementia. People with um, B12 shortage or severe potassium, that could look like dementia. They could be delirious, looks like dementia. So not all memory loss equals Alzheimer's, but there needs to be a series of tests conducted. They're comprehensive in nature before they can arrive at, this is probably Alzheimer's. So the diagnosis can only be confirmed upon autopsy at this point. Yeah. So what does that mean? It means there's a lot of people running around undiagnosed, right? Because people will say, oh my God, I'm not going to put my mother through that. She's 85. You know, so as much as we try to convince people of the value of getting an early diagnosis, you know, we tell them, well, it could be something treatable. You know, that's the major thing that we say, but um, we also tell them, well, it's better to really know where you stand. How can you plan if you don't really know what you're dealing with? So we try to make this argument for getting a diagnosis, but it doesn't always happen. Or they go to a family doctor who's like, well, of course you have memory loss, you're 85. You know, or they do one simple test and say, you're Alzheimer's. So it's tough. It's really tough. Are there special doctors? Yes. And we at Alzheimer's Orange County have referrals for families. You each have a postcard that talks about our helpline. We can give families referrals to uh, diagnostic clinics um, or practitioners that are that know about this and luckily there's a lot in South County I mean we actually have a lot of resources in Orange County but it's a matter of connecting people with them nobody wants to call Alzheimer's right it's like you know you can help us with that connect connect families to us so where were we We were talking about diagnosis I tend to get off the track a little bit myself oh yeah that was it so don't interrupt <laughs> See how I did that? <laughs> okay, so we're going to focus on the feelings. Like, say the person is repeating, 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 repeating. So we might be, you know, I might be kind of looking at you, and I'm not paying any attention to the words, but I'm just watching and assessing, and that's what all of you do. It, are you, does Marlis look happy or does she look scared? Is she like tapping her foot in annoyance? You know, you just kind of tune in to all of that and try not to, you know, go crazy listening to the same phrases over and over again, okay? My personal client, she's, uh, we spend all day talking about what day it is and what time it is. And that goes on till about two o'clock. And then she says, have we got stuff for dinner tonight? And that's the first time she asks it. And it goes on until 4 o'clock when I'm finally like, I'm cooking dinner now. <laughs> I can't take this anymore. <laughs> this every day. Every day. <laughs> and there's a lot more, but I'm trying to make the point here. It's like that repetition is hardwired in people with dementia. And once dinner is over, her next question that she repeats about 85 times is, have we locked the front door? Yeah. And I go, yeah, we have. And then she'll say, did we lock the kitchen door? And I'll say, we locked all the doors. Did we lock the slider? Yeah. <laughs> and this is like over and over and over again. And so what's the feeling behind that repetition? What's the feeling behind saying, did we lock the door over and over? She's nervous or feeling insecure, scared. So that's my cue to give her extra reassurance. You know, I'll say, oh, we're so safe and sound. And I usually, I've been with her six years, so I can do this. I put my arms around her and I go, oh, I'm so glad I'm here with you. Here we are, safe and sound in your beautiful home. You know, so it's a cue, you know, for feeling during the day she's disoriented. And then, you know, at night, it's that security thing. So we focus on the feelings and we have to be patient, right? Yes, we do. So we do some deep breathing sometimes, right? Sometimes, yeah. Okay, and then we facilitate that tight connection again with eye contact. 
little bit of touch, but we got to have professional boundaries. So, I mean, you have to be careful about that, and I know you all know that. I mean, just because I put my arms around my client, I wouldn't do that to a male client, right? And I wouldn't do it unless I really knew the person well. So everybody has, you know, good judgment about that. But I will say, like, if they take your hand, it's great to hold on to them because you're their anchor. And when they seek touch, it's, that's a connection they're seeking, and so that's good. We use a calm voice, we speak simply and slowly because they need time to process what we're saying and then to actually speak back to us. So keep an eye on the environment and this plays out in behaviors as well as you know your ability to connect with people. If there's too much activity or too much noise you know, maybe your client is used to having the TV on in every room. I've known a lot of seniors like that in, where you're walking around. It's like, <laughs> who's watching this? You know? So, you know, try to turn down the noise. Um, you know, overly bright or overly dark settings are going to cause problems, uh, especially with perception. Like most Alzheimer people are like my client. She gets freaked out about reflections. You know, like if there's a sunbeam coming in the room and it's going across the, this polished floor, you know, she thinks it's a physical object laying there, right? Or when the shadows start to fall, you know, she starts to think there are people in the bushes. So what do we do? This is an easy solve. Close the curtains. <laughs> yeah, I close the curtains. I make it real... Comfy in there and cozy, you know. Yeah. I do have a question about I, I caught something at the tail end on NPR about lead light and some research being done with. Yeah, I think they've done some research around what's the most effective type of lighting, and I don't know, but I will look up that NPR uh, resource. The high fluorescent lights are not good. So, you know, you ha it's kind of tricky because they need enough light so they can see. Clearly, I mean, that's a safety thing, right? But if it's like shining on a floor that's polished and providing a glare, then that's a problem. So just sort of eyeball the environments that you're working in. And sometimes you can tweak things a little bit by closing curtains or turning up lights or down lights, you know. But the one I heard was being used as a treatment, something about... Oh, like a lights? solar therapy? Yeah, but Oh, okay. Well, there's always a lot of theories, and there's a lot of studies going on. I haven't heard about that one yet, but let's not try this at home until, <laughs> until they go through the human subjects part of that. But yeah, the too bright or too dark settings is hard, and I honestly, I, I'm a big fan of night lights. Uh, of course, and you know, when my client gets up at night, she gets a full standing assist from me. Um, I, but I have the door to the bathroom open so she can see the toilet. You know, you're using more and more prompts, more and more cues, more and more clues with people as they progress through the disease. Mirrors and other reflecting surfaces can be a problem. You know, there's an HBO film that was done about, I don't know, 10 years ago, a whole series uh, following people with Alzheimer's, and one was called The Friend in the Mirror. And there was a lady living in long-term care, and she thought that her reflection in the mirror was her friend. And so, uh, but it wasn't a negative. She talked to her friend, she engaged with her, she was happy, and so there was no need for an intervention because, again, we step into their world. We don't try to pull them out. But in other cases, you might have an older client. Maybe they don't know that they're 95 years old. They think they're 30. And then they see themselves in the mirror, and they're like, who is that person looking at me? Who is this person spying on me? You know, you just never know. So it's case by case, but some Alzheimer folks do have delusions and hallucinations, 
And sometimes they just perceive the world differently. So we do what we can because we're not in our own home, right? We're in their home. So you can't go in and, you know, redecorate. But you can do a couple little tweaks that might be very helpful. So I think we're going to keep going here because um, what time is it? Four, five, six. Okay, yeah. So I want to just make sure I cover all of the material. So I want to talk about the do's and the don'ts. And first thing I want to tell you is that a lot of this material that you're seeing on the slides have been pulled into this handout for you. I didn't want you to have to like make notes or anything like that. So the key concepts are pulled into the handbook There's, uh, or the workbook. There's even places where you can reflect and write little things about your client or clients that you work with. Um, the second thing is that handout compassionate communication is like the best thing I've ever read about dementia. You know, it was written like 20 years ago and um, by a family caregiver, her name was Liz. She was caring for her father with vascular dementia for 20 years. And she learned a lot of things, but she learned them all the hard way. So she put together this handout, Compassionate Communication, in hopes that family, other families wouldn't have to learn the hard way. And we've been using that handout ever since. It's never been updated. You know, because the disease never changes, or the diseases. I mean, really, these basic tenets are always true. So you have that handout, and you can read that, and it talks a lot about the do's and the don'ts. So the don'ts are, you know, we don't want to reason with people because they have no way to take that in. So we keep our explanations really short, and we don't try to, like, quote, unquote, build a case for something you know like if they say i don't want to go to the doctor there's nothing wrong with me we're not going to sit there and say really well i have your medical history in front of me and i'm here to tell you i mean that is not going to work right so we're not going to reason with them we're just going to say something like you know it's just a checkup and then we're going to redirect them right so we don't say no we validate, we reassure, and then we skillfully redirect. So instead of reading them their medical history, I'm going to say, you know what? It's just a checkup, and I think we should stop and get ice cream on the way back. <laughs> I always use food as an example because that's what I love, right? <laughs> You guys saw me eating that sandwich two minutes before my talk, right? So you can kind of redirect me with food anytime. But the thing is, and we'll get into this, we know when we know our clients and we know their likes and dislikes, that's called person-centered care, we might be able to re create some redirection for them instead of just saying no or trying to reason with them. Does that make sense? And we'll, we'll do some examples. So we're not going to reason. We're not going to argue with them. You know, if they say they're 35, they're 35. Again, we're not going to say, you know, no, mother, actually. You know, my client tells me all the time, I haven't eaten all day. <laughs> and, and then, and you know, and I'm always like, yeah, well, you know. I think you did eat something. Tell me everything I ate. <laughs> but basically, she can't remember she's eaten. And so rather than get caught up in this whole, yes, of course you ate today, and then reciting everything I fed her all day, which is what I sort of want to do, right? I just say, oh my gosh, you're hungry. Let's eat. And then we just sit down. I mean, she eats all day. We have, you know, she's on a special diet. But we give her little tiny meals all the time, and, you know, it works out great. So we make it harder on ourselves, you know, is the point I'm trying to make, just because we're human. So when somebody says to me, you haven't fed me all day, I take that personally, right? <laughs> it's like, what do you mean? I would never do that to you. Listen, I made you pancakes with bacon and toast this morning. You know, that's what I want to do. But you can't. You can't. You just say, oh, you're hungry. Let's eat. Me too. Yes. 
smoker. Yeah. Cigarette? Yeah. How would you how would you do anything? Is there anything else that she loves doing? Or is smoking just eating? Okay. Well eating's better than smoking. <laughs> so she could so you might try. Like she'll say, Oh, I'm gonna go I'm ready for a cigarette and you might say, Okay, you don't say no. <laughs> do not say no. <laughs> say, okay, and then you know what? Why don't we have a snack first? See if that works. But listen, at the end of the day, you can't stop people from what they want to do. And so what are, instead of trying to stop her, we're just going to keep her safe, right? We're just going to make sure she doesn't blow, burn the house down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. But telling her she just had one, trust me, that is not going to work. No, you're just, yeah, exactly. She just gets mad. Yeah. Got to watch those smokers, man. With yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, her. Uh, who's the responsible party with her? Is it her adult child or her husband? Is he there? Oh, okay, okay. Because, you know, I might, like if my client wanted to do something that I wasn't sure about, I would clear it with the family. You know, I'm really transparent with the family, you know, because they, we need to be transparent with the families. But anyway, you can't talk people out of a behavior. You might be able to redirect them or delay them, but, you know, just keep them safe. So um, we don't remind them they're forgetting. You know, we don't go to their house and say, remember me, it's Kim. I'm I've been coming here for 48 years. <laughs> We're not going to test people, right? What could we do instead? Just, you just introduce yourself. Hey, it's Kim. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. So we don't remind them. We don't question their recent memory. We don't take things personally, even though, darn, that's tough. Um, so what we do is we keep repeating... You know, I talk about my client. She repeats herself all day. Well, guess who else does? You know, I repeat. You know, we're just like two minor birds. <laughs> because I have these set answers to her set questions. And sometimes I think, if anybody ever taped this, they think that this is like, you know, crazy. So we just, you know, repeat. And we take the blame. We take the blame. Oh, my God, 100%. You know, you didn't feed me all day. Oh, I am so sorry. We're going to have something right now. We always accept the blame, even when it's not our fault. Um, we, we leave the room if it gets heated. It's okay. You can walk away for a minute. I mean, I have to do that sometimes. You know, my client is, she's gone from early stage to late stage, and I'm, she has full one-on-one -on -one assistance, and we never leave her out of her line of sight, you know, because she's a fall risk. But by gosh, you know, it's hard. So sometimes I just step out on the deck to get some fresh air. I can see her, <laughs> you know, but I just need to go out there and just breathe. So it's okay to step away. It's better to do that than to, you know, have your mouth down. <laughs> um, and we just agree. We agree with them. Whatever they say, it's like, yep. And that is so hard for us, right? I swear, we, there's something about our society. It's like we all have to be knowledgeable. <laughs> and when somebody says something like a friend, we're all, no, actually, that wasn't quite how it happened. You know, we love to correct each other, right? And if we don't know the answer, we're going to Google it immediately and say, no, no, I know. <laughs> So, I mean, that's kind of how we're hardwired, but we can't do that. We have to just sort of agree and go along with them and let them have their, their perception of reality. And then we're going to use that really great skill of distraction or redirection. And so let's look at some examples of that. So this is what I was talking about. This is sort of a formula. We're going to validate, reassure, and then redirect, right? That's going to be our little one, two, three. So shower, 
I just took a shower. What you're thinking is, oh, no, you didn't. You haven't had a shower for three days. <laughs> right? And you might say, yeah, we got to get you in that shower. You haven't had a shower for three days. You might get an infection. And if, what are they going to say? That is not true. I took a shower 10 minutes ago. <laughs> or whatever, right? I mean, you're setting yourself up for a confrontation. So, oh, but you know what? Today's our regular bath day. I am so sorry I forgot to tell you. Why don't we go get cleaned up, and after that, we'll have a snack. Always the food with me. <laughs> or it could be we'll play cards, or we'll go for a drive, whatever it is that your client likes to do. So see, this, and it won't work all the time, trust me. But I mean, isn't this a much more dignified approach? By the way, I never even say the word shower with my client. I, call, <laughs> I used to call it the spa day. <laughs> We're going to have a spa day. Um, but now she doesn't know what a spa is. So I just say, we're going to have a day of beauty. And I'm going, we're going to get your shower. Not, I'm going to give you a shower. We're going to get your shower. I'm going to give you a scalp massage. And then afterwards, I'm going to give you a full body massage. So see, there's this other little tool called last word connection. That means that they really can only hang on to the very last thing you say. So in this case, what was it? Massage. And she's like, oh. Oh, I do. And I usually go like this. <laughs> or I go like this. And then we'll have a full body massage. So, you know, I can do this with my client because we have that easy intimacy and we've been together a long time. But, you know, sometimes it's sort of how you present things. You know, because if it's like, come on, it's time to get in the shower, it's like, nah, I don't want to take a shower. You know, I try to make it sound really appealing. And then actually, I drag the whole thing out for a long time because she's at the point where she really can't do a lot of activities anymore. So we used to do a lot of things, and now we can't. And so I sort of drag that out for three hours. And I might give her a foot soak and what? Well, we have to fill the day, right? So, and we have to change our activities as the disease progresses. We used to go out all the time. You know, when she would get crabby, I'd say, come on, let's get in the car. Let's get out of here. And we'd go on what she called an adventure. And we'd go on picnics. We'd go down to the beach. Um, we went on car trips all over the place. We used to ride the trolley in Laguna for hours. Well, she can't do any of those things now. She's homebound. And, you know, it's hard. It's hard for me. You know, I mean, I'm grieving because I feel like, you know, well, you know, the quality of life is diminishing and it's not as fun for me either. And so I have to adapt and find other ways to bring joy into her life when we can't leave the house. So the day of beauty literally can go on forever. <laughs> so, okay. So, but I, I'm sort of getting off track here. So this was an example of don't reason. So your client says, oh, honey, you can go now. I have to leave to pick up the kids at school. Have you ever heard that? Anything like that? Yeah, that's the reality. And so your impulse is to say, uh, wait a minute, that can't be because you're 85 and so your kids are probably seniors themselves. So yeah, that's what you want to say, but you cannot say that, y'all. You've got to say something like, um, wow, it sounds like you're missing your kids now. Why don't we, um, we don't really have to pick them up till later. So why don't we look at some pictures of them? Or why don't we play cards until it's time to go? See, you know, you gotta really be sort of crafty with this, right? I mean, anything is better than saying, what? <laughs> Your kids are grown, they're not in school anymore. So this is a great example of how we're validating, we're sort of responding to the feelings behind the statements. Um, and we're not saying no, 
We're just saying, okay, but guess what? I don't think they're ready to be picked up yet. So why don't we play cards for a while? And if cards is an activity she enjoys or he enjoys, then you've got it made because they're going to forget they were just doing that. So we sort of manipulate their short-term forgetfulness in a way that produces a, a positive outcome for them. Nobody's making decisions for me. You, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I won't be back. And so I usually use this example when I'm working with people that work in a memory care unit. And so the bad response is, oh, really? How are you going to leave? You're in a locked unit. <laughs> is that what we want to tell people? <laughs> You're not going anywhere. You live in a secured memory unit. <laughs> of course we're not going to say that. We're going to say, oh, I'm sorry. I can see that you're having a tough time. You know what? I care about you. We're going to get through this. So, you know, the feelings behind that, you know, are so profound when someone's like, you know what? Just get out. I can take care of myself. There's so much pain in that, isn't there? I can see myself saying that to someone. I mean, I'm already thinking about it because my sister's all, hey, Kim, you know, I'm going to build a tiny house in my backyard for you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> so I understand how this would be really hard. And so I would just want to acknowledge that. It's like, oh, gosh, you, I'm so sad that... You're sad now. You know, I love you, and let's just take a minute. Let's just breathe. You know, sometimes when my client gets overwrought, I'll say, we're going to do deep breathing. Breathe in through your nose. <laughs> breathe out. And that totally distracts her. It totally distracts her, and it helps her. It calms her. And so um, sometimes I feel like the world's biggest fraud. <laughs> But I want you to know I totally love her, and I love all the clients that I work with at Alzheimer's during the day, and I will do what it takes to give them a good experience, even if it means me needing to be devious or to incorporate that therapeutic uh, fibbing. I'll use these tools because I want them to be happy. So it's okay. Don't remind them they forgot. I haven't seen my daughter for years. <laughs> and you so want to say, oh my gosh, she was just here yesterday, right? She comes every week. But you can't say that. You just can't say that. What you can say is you really love your daughter, don't you? Why don't we call her when we get back from our walk, right? I mean, isn't that just so much more dignified? These are good approaches. They're hard for us because it's not the way we react to people. And so, I mean, trust me, I've been teaching uh, this class for 100 years, and I live it, and I still make mistakes all the time. And so you have to be easy on yourself and to know that, you know, you're not going to be perfect every time. And even if you do everything perfect every time, sometimes it's still not going to work out. But it will work out more often. You'll have better outcomes when you use these approaches. So, you know, the client says, hey, what's your name? And you go, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm Kim. I'm here every day. Right? Check your ego at the door. Because the best thing, as we just said a few minutes ago, is to just introduce yourself. Hey, it's Kim. I'm looking forward to being with you today. What do you want to do? Or, you know, just don't take it personally. Get out. I don't need your help. <laughs> and you say, oh, that's the thanks I get. <laughs> I'm sure you have. And you wanted to say, oh, my gosh, I worked so hard, you know, to make this person happy. And now they're telling me to get out or else it traumatizes you, or you have PTSD because some ex-husband, you know, it's like, oh, you're just like my ex-husband. 
<laughs> he told me he didn't need me either. <laughs> you can't take it personally. You have to just say, you know, no problem, no problem. You know, I am so sorry. Stop the blame. I'm so sorry I upset you. Um, you know what? I'm going to just give you a minute. Just let me do, let's just give each other a minute. And that's when you maybe step back. Give that person a little space. Be quiet. You know, sometimes you can't rush in and fix everything. Just give the person a little bit of time to compose themselves. The thing about dementia is they forget. Sometimes, not always. But there's a high chance that that person will get over it way before you do. Right? And so we just can't take things personally. Because if we do, we make them worse. Okay, I'm going to skip over that. Um, and so, what, will we take little breaks in this? Where's Mary? Are we ready for a break? Okay. So we have a half an hour, right, Mary? Yes. All right, so we're going to roll right through this. Um, b because everything sort of is layered in this training. You know, once you have a solid foundation of how to communicate effectively, um, then it makes it so much easier to manage some of these dementia-related behaviors. And then in the last segment, we're going to talk about activities, which are really the best way to intervene with behaviors. So it's like a one, two, three approach. And so we're going to go through number, uh, the second one, which is managing dementia-related behaviors. So again, I've got some sort of core principles. We have to know that the person with dementia experiences the world differently than we do. Behaviors may not make any sense to us but they make perfect sense in the experience and perception of the client, right? So, you know, behavior could be, you know, you walk in and the client is stark naked, right? And you're like, oh my God, they're a pervert. <laughs> no, <laughs> they might just be hot and not in a good way. You know what I mean? <laughs> they might just be warm. And so it's like a primitive. Some behaviors are just coming from primitive urges. They're uncomfortable, they're warm, and so they, they're trying to get some of the, that heat off of them. So I always use these examples to make sure everybody's paying attention to me. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't make sense to us or we make a judgment about the behavior, but it actually makes perfect sense to the person. Um, and behaviors, as I said earlier, are nothing more than unmet needs, which the client is just not able to communicate to us. And we must enter their world in order to understand their experiences. That's called empathy, and I, we all have it. Um, and really, in order to validate their feelings. And we're going to keep self-monitoring our own body language and our tone of voice, all those things we talked about last time in the approach, those things matter because sometimes something we're doing can be the trigger for a behavior. And of course, we don't want that to happen. So I've already said that, or no, maybe I didn't say. If I did, I'll, I'll repeat it. <laughs> but there's usually a reason for these behaviors. People don't get up in the morning and think, oh, I'm going to give that person <laughs> hell today. <laughs> you know, they're not able to think that way. They're not able to, like, really manipulate in that way because they just don't have the brain power to do that. So there are usually some kind of a trigger, and these are four of the most common triggers. So let's start with physical because it's the, really the most important one. So I want you to think about... What are some things that would make you physically uncomfortable and you weren't able to talk about it? Just anything. I'll start. Headache. Yeah. Stomach pain. Stomach pain. Go to the bathroom. Need to go to the bathroom. I think somebody said they have gas. Too hot. Keep it to yourself, buddy. No. I'm <laughs> just kidding. You're too hot. Hungry. What? Hungry. Hungry. Feet hurting. Your feet hurt. That's the worst. You're what? Lonely. Nope, that's not physical. Oh, physical. Two things. What? 
toothaches. Tired. Tired. I have a rock in my shoe. Or my clothing's too tight. You know, I mean, there's... All right. Oh, here's one. (laughs) I have a tag in my shirt, right, that's irritating me, right? I mean, there's all these things that are like, really, you know, they can... Or the person could be sick. They could be ill. So when you see a behavior, think physical first and ask yourself, are they thirsty or hungry? Do you think they have to go to the bathroom? What do they look like when they have to go to the bathroom? What, what, they're fidgety, and they might be pulling at their, they might be pacing and pulling at their clothing. Um, they might be too hot. They might be too cold. They might, might not be feeling well. They may not be, they may be in pain. And so, or maybe they're on a new medication. So we have to really make ourselves think this way. Because as I said earlier, a lot of causes of behaviors are simple things that can be cured, like UTIs. Actually, it's not a simple thing. It's chronic, and people, you know, many people with dementia, it's not a simple thing, but it causes a lot of trouble. So think medical, and I'll give you a very dramatic example of this. Years ago, um, this is an awful story. There was a man living in a boarding care, and he uh, always slept through the night, and then suddenly he wasn't. You know, he was getting up and pacing. He was you know, sort of agitated, and the caregivers kept trying to put him back to bed, which was their first mistake. <laughs> but anyway, uh, things got worse, and they decided, oh, well, he's, we're going to have to medicate him. So they put him on something. I think at the time it was like Haldol. And next thing you know, he's like combative and, you know, violent. And so they sent him to a gyro psych, and while he was there, he fell out of bed and broke his hip. He ended up in a nursing home. I mean, it was this horrible sequence of events. And as it turned out, he had undiagnosed congestive heart failure. And so that was his problem. And what happens when you have that? You can't breathe when you are laying down. He couldn't say you know, that something physically was wrong. And so they treated a physical problem with psychiatric, with a psychiatric approach, and he went into this tailspin. So that is a dramatic, you know, sort of case that happened early in my career. And, you know, people really are so much better trained now. But, I mean, we have to think physical, we have to think medical before we even, you know, start to think about how to intervene. So... Now, what about emotional triggers? I mean, uh, environmental triggers. What am I talking about here? What could trigger a behavior in the environment? We really already talked about this, didn't we? Change. Yeah, I mean, I always tell families, don't change the furniture around, you know. Leave everything the same, you know. They're always, like, working on the house, and it's like, no, no, that's just, like, no, not good for dementia. So, yeah, we talked about this, how all of these factors, you know, sort of can trigger behaviors and what we can do to to help with that. And then there's a complicated task trigger. So what do I mean by this? Something that you all did all the time, but now... They can't do it anymore. Yeah, like the dryer. Like, yeah. Yeah, so kid, you're new, right? Yes. (laughs) way to go no I mean we're asking them to do things that they simply can't do anymore and you know what professionals aren't usually like this it's the families that do this you know I mean for weeks I kept telling my client's uh, family she can't be alone at night this was you know in the beginning she she can't, she's not making dinner and, and, and the son kept saying oh yeah she makes a, a frozen dinner at night in the microwave, and I'm like, well, uh, she can't. She can't use the microwave. You know, that's one of the first things to go in dementia. They can't use the devices, um, and and you know. But he kept insisting that she could, and it's like, no, dude, she can't. You know, so I just started taking dinner over there, you know, because anyway. So it was too much for her. She just did not know how to operate the the microwave anymore, and so that causes frustration and embarrassment. You know, common tasks and activities, they're no longer a fit with where they are in their functioning level. 
or we're giving them instructions that are too complex, um, or we're speaking too fast, or we're not leaving enough time, right? And so we just have to, you know, keep in mind that things change and it's subtle. You know, I mean, they don't change overnight, but there's a subtle change and a subtle progression, and we have to sort of keep assessing and reassessing to make sure the things that we're asking our clients to do, they're still capable of doing. And then emotional triggers. They're lonely. They're acting now because they're lonely or what? Sad. They are so fearful. Who said that? Yeah, they are. They're so scared all the time. They, yeah, they are. And so that can cause, you know, behavioral. Uh, anytime they feel like their safety or security is challenged, um, or control and productivity. You know, I mean, I had a client the other day. Um, I was, I forget what happened. Oh, I was moving some things off a table. And he said, here, let me help you. And I said, no, no, I got it. Big no. mistake. <laughs> and you know what he said to me? He said, you know what? I can still lift a box. Whoa. You know, so this is what I mean. I mean, even, you know, I mean, I make a lot of mistakes. I mean, it's, it's hard not to. <laughs> but, I mean, I undermined him not meaning to. I'm, a, I'm the kind of person I want to help everybody. But sometimes we just... But you're living in two worlds. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's how you interact with the whole world and how you interact with dementia, right? Although some of these techniques might work with bosses, husbands, <laughs> wives. I don't know. So, and then people may not feel loved or valued. So, you know, the person with dementia may say, oh, my gosh, I haven't seen my daughter for years. No matter that the daughter's there every week, her perception is that she's not. And so somehow we're going to need to fill that gap to keep that from going into a behavior. So this is a bunch of fancy stuff, but you already know what person-centered care is. It means that we are going to develop a plan of care for each of our clients based on them as an individual, this is not like, oh, Alzheimer care plan one. You know, it, there's no one size, one size fits all plan. Our care planning and our activities are based on what we know about these individuals. And, you know, person centered care was developed like in the 80s, you guys, by a guy named Tom Kitwood. And he was, you know, the, he wrote a real fancy book about it. And he talked about how in order to meet the psychological needs of people with dementia, they have to be, have security in these areas. Comfort, identity, occupation, inclusion, and attachment. And you know, when you think about it, it fits. Because we all want to feel a, a sense of identity. We all want to be included. We want to be attached to something. We want to be in control of things. And we want to feel like we're engaged in meaningful, you know, occupation. So when you apply a person-centered approach to behaviors, wow, it works so well to control behaviors, especially the part about what they did for a living. And so um, I'll give you some examples. But basically, you know, the intake, whoever does the assessment and the intake of the client, needs to know these things. They really do. And then you, as a caregiver, need to know these things. And um, I'll give you an example of, let's see, which example should I give you? All right, so there was a, I know there, I know there was this, um, there was a man that we were working with years ago at the Alzheimer's, and he um, was admitted to a memory care unit. I think I told this story last time, but when he was admitted, he was such a nice man. When he was admitted, admitted, he kind of went ballistic and he started slamming around the hallways and pushing past people and going in and out of people's rooms. He was highly agitated. 
And they said, oh, we cannot keep him. He's too, you know, agitated. And so we said, well, what did he do for a living? Well, it turns out the man was a general contractor. Did I tell you this story before? Okay, he was all his life. And what does it mean when you're a general contractor? You're the boss. And you're constantly inspecting, right? We gave him a clipboard. We gave him a clipboard to put in his hands. And that pacing and agitation behavior turned right into inspecting. So, you know, this is one of the keys, I think. You know, because I've seen it all over the last, you know, quarter of a century. I mean, I've seen, like, former physicians, you know, that they made, like, a false set of records for. for so he could, he was in a nursing home. And he couldn't, he, st- he kept coming in the nurse's station and everything and bothering everybody. So they finally made him a set of books. And he just looked over patient records all day. People tend to want to keep doing the things that are so deeply ingrained, and then they feel productive. And so, you know, it's just, I don't know, you really, the more you know about a person, the more you can apply this. And then, you know, a similar concept is called contented involvement. And what contented involvement means is that, I mean, if someone's in a state of of contented involvement, they're in a zone between over and under stimulation because both are enemies for the dementia patient. If they're overstimulate, overstimulated, you'll see behaviors. If they're understimulated, you'll see behaviors. So we're always looking to get them in this place where they're occupied and feeling and get, you know, engaging with something. So staff should have a short list, and they get this from the person-centered approach, of things that that person finds calming, okay? So with my client, what she likes to do is what this lady's doing in the picture. She likes to sit and look out the window and view all the neighborhood activities. She's done it all her life. She's nosy. You know, I mean, that is like a big thing to her is just like, oh, there's, you know, it started with, oh, look at that neighbor. I think she blah, 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 blah. It started with gossip. Now it's kind of devolved to there's three white cars out there. She'll say there's, she'll tell me there's three white cars out there. But the activity is the same. It's like she's in her zone when she's gazing upon the neighborhood. So um, when you see your resident, you know, sort of going off or getting agitated or getting sad or whatever a negative behavior is, and when it starts happening, you should have some go-to things that you can do with them. And so let me, so the formula for managing behaviors, and I'm gonna go deeper into the things you can do in just a minute. The formula for managing behaviors is, you know, to assess what are the triggers, you know, kind of look for a pattern, what's, you know, what could be behind this behavior, and then apply a person-centered approach. What do you know about your client that can help you understand and deal with this particular behavior? And then three, you intervene using a a contented involvement type activity to get them back to their comfort zone, okay? So let's go right into activities because that those things that I'm talking about, those soothing activities are what we're gonna, you know, sort of do a deep dive into now. So in this part of the training, we're going to just keep talking about person-centered care and contented involvement and a couple of other things before we end. So, I mean, if you apply a person-centered approach to activity planning, it's perfect. I mean, it just means that those activities are things that you know the client likes because they're planned and conducted around their life history, their preferences, and their needs and interests. And so... All activities that you do, they don't have to be fancy. You know, everybody thinks, oh, i got to think of some really exotic things. They don't have to be fancy. They should just produce a feeling of comfort, belonging, being included, having some kind of purpose, 
all those things that we talked about in person-centered care. So you have to have that information about your clients. So um, you take what you know and you can use it to connect through, you know, a meaningful one-on-one -on -one activity. And even when you're doing um, personal care, it's an activity. Remember the day of beauty? Mm -hmm. You know, or sometimes I do her hair, and I blow it dry, and I'm like, hey, we're at the beauty parlor. And she just sits there, and this look on her face is like so content when I'm just even brushing her hair. So you can do, everything you do is an activity. So here's a few ideas. Um, you know, looking at photo books, maybe having coffee or tea together. Um, you know, that's a ritual that a lot of women have done, and men too, for many years. So it could be just holding a familiar object you know, what? You, you look around at their personal things. You know, maybe on the dresser you see an award that your client bought, or won, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Can you tell I'm getting tired? <laughs> so, you know, if, if you see someone sort of, you know, getting frustrated or being negative, you might, you know, hand that object and say, tell me about this award. Um, you can listen to music. Music is a winner, usually for everyone. Everyone enjoys music, and you find out what kind of music they like. Singing together, taking a walk together, holding hands. All of these are simple activities that can bring a person sort of back to a state of contented involvement. And then I use the best friends approach. And this is a well-known uh, theory by a guy named David Troxell. He wrote a book about, I don't know, it was several, a number of years ago, called The Best Friend's Approach to Dementia Care. And what he has said all along is that what a person with dementia really needs is not a caregiver, but a best friend. And so if you try to position yourself as a companion or friend, more than I'm here to take care of you. You know, we get better results that way, don't we? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, when you function as more of a friend, I think it makes your clients feel more inclined to enjoy the care that you are offering them. And so, like when I do activities with my clients at Alzheimer's Orange County, I'll say, I feel like singing today. Does anybody want to sing with me? And they all laugh. You know, instead of saying something like, it's time for singing, go sit in the circle, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm not leading it. It's like they're joining me in the activity, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think you get what I mean. Especially if you're a best friend type, then they trust you because you're sort of they do. paranoid, aren't they? Oh, they, well, life. just think about any adult that, you know, like my client is in their 80s. Isn't your typical client 80 or older? Mm -hmm. I know there's diversity, but you've got to figure they've already had a lot of loss. You know, they've lost a lot of their people in their support network, and they've lost their independence. So, um, yeah, it's really tough. And so when you're coming into their life now, if you sort of position yourself as a companion as opposed to an aide or a helper, you know, my client to this day doesn't know that I'm a professional. She thinks I'm her friend, mm -hmm. you know, bless her heart, and I do love her. Mm -hmm. But if she knew I was being paid, she'd just come unglued. <laughs> <laughs> it would be, you know, but I've positioned myself that way. In fact, I wear street clothes. I mean, sweats, comfortable, you know. So, I mean, it's just one approach. And just think about the kind of care that you would want. Like if some stranger was coming into your home to help you with your personal things, you know, I'd rather feel like that person was friend material. So I think it's really nice. And you can still maintain your professional boundaries as well, right? So the best friends approach, I think, really has a, a, a really nice element that we can add. And then finally, you know, when we're thinking about doing activities, we need to right-size them. 
uh, and I've talked about this already, as they change in the illness, we need to simplify the activity. So I want to just give you, and in fact, as they get to later stages, we're going to do mostly sensory activities. So in the few minutes that I have left, I'm going to go through some of these examples of things that we can do around the senses, especially for later stage. So the sense of touch, doing tactile things. Um, lotion hand massages are wonderful. Sculpting using non-toxic materials. Petting something furry. If they don't have a pet, it could be, even be a stuffed animal. Um, the site, we can laminate pictures of things that might inspire, you know, reminiscing or positive emotions. There are a lot of really cool videos on TV now that you can watch of nature. Uh, bird watching is fun, painting, uh, going outside, just, or if they can't go outside, just sit by an open window because people just have to have fresh air. Um, sound, listening to favorite music, uh, there's recordings of nature and farm sounds, like for a person who used to be a farmer, uh, working with musical instruments, listening to songs or even poetry or books in that person's native language, because remember, if they have dementia, they go back to their native language, even if they've been speaking English for years. And sometimes they enjoy hearing you read aloud to them since they can't read anymore. Uh, smell, I just use the frequent lotions. Uh, I do do some uh, aromatherapy, but you have to be careful about that because sometimes people are allergic to that. But cooking something uh, that smells good, like cookies, you know, or baking bread. You know, a lot of these long-term care communities now have bread machines and cookies going all the time just because it smells like home and it's a comfort to people. Anything that engages the mind, body, and soul. Music and singing is great. Um, rhythm and music, people love to dance a lot of times well into the illness. We have art that we can do. There's a Memories in the Making art program that we sponsor where they actually paint messages, even nonverbal people paint messages that have meaning to their families. They'll look at the paintings and they'll say, oh my gosh, that's where we got married. You know, there's so much that we can do to tap into people, even late in the illness. We can do word games, reminiscing, exercise, seated exercise if they're frail. Um, no, you have to know if this person's a person of faith. And, you know, are you a person of faith? Well, that's great because then you can do some spiritual activities together that will really be meaningful. Um, just remember, everything you do with your clients is an activity, even personal care. And every time you do an activity, it doesn't have to be fancy, but it provides that opportunity to make that connection that we were talking about earlier that's so important. And that connection is really more important than any task you can do with them. I mean, just making that connection, improving their day. Um, they never lose the desire to communicate and connect with others. And so, of course, uh, it's a great thing to be able to do for them. Okay, so whew, I have three minutes for questions. <laughs> And I didn't talk about sundowners. I was just gonna oh. talk about that. That's what I was gonna okay, sundowning is like classic Alzheimer. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost everybody does it. And it means that as the day wears on, when you get into the later afternoon and early evening hours, you're going to see an uptick in behaviors and in agitation, maybe even delusions. So this is a tough time of day for people. The changing light... Um, the sense of, it's, I should be going somewhere, you know. I mean, there's been a lot of speculation about why it happens, but I think basically people are getting tired by that time of the day. And, you know, they're just more prone to, you know, agitation, et cetera, just as the day wears on. But um, expect it, 
and be reassuring. Maybe think if that, that could be a time when you could take a walk if they're able to do that or one of those, you know, contented involvement type activities. But be prepared for that because it's a very natural thing and it, is gonna, it, it does happen with most clients. It's not something you did. It's just something innate that's happening. So, I don't know. I think sometimes it's like all our lives, we're sort of programmed to do something at 5 o'clock, right? What happens at 5 o'clock? Cocktails. Cocktails? I like the way you think. Or getting off work or we're going somewhere. It's like I think they still are kind of programmed that way. It's like where am I supposed to be? Aren't I supposed to be doing something now? So they get very restless and agitated. So we use that formula, right? We sort of assess. We know what the trigger is. We're going to reassure. We're going to validate. And we're going to say, you know what? I need help with something. Could you help me? And then maybe do a task like folding laundry, something that's soothing with repetition. Those activities with repetition are good. Sorting things. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. She's bored. Yeah. She's too understimulated, and so she's just picking at herself. And uh, my client does that too sometimes, and so I'll say, you know what? Your hands are dry. Why don't you, t- I'm going to give you some lotion. Why don't you work it into your hands? I do that all the time, you know, because it kind of keeps her occupied. Most people with dementia, once they're later stage, can only do one thing at a time. So if you even give them something to hold, they're going to stop that picking. You know, I mean, you can, they can only... It's futile. Yeah. You could cover that area or you could redirect her. But, you know, just to say stop doing that is pointless. It's pointless. So, but giving her something to do, I think, would be best. Other questions? Okay. Well, I thank you so much. We thank you. And-